Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Morris again. I am, have the pleasure of talking to you about diarrhea. Um, not, not a great topic, but it's, it's kind of fun. We'll, we'll see a bunch of different things. So um, there's many causes of diarrhea in the shelters. I'm sure you guys know. Um, most common cause is um, either intestinal parasites, change of diet, or like we talked about with the respiratory system, we can have stress. So um, diarrhea can be an emergency situation. Of course, in our smaller animals and our younger animals, um, they can become very dehydrated pretty quickly. So if you have lethargy, um, not really acting very well, or vomiting, or not eating, um, you also those are some of the other signs with diarrhea that you need to go and grab your veterinarian um, because additional tests should be performed, and then, of course, fluids if they need them. So let's go on to our talk. Um, Association of Shelter Veterinarians states that all animals entering shelters are infected with internal and external parasites. So the internal ones are intestinal parasites, and then our external ones are, of course, our fleas and our, our ticks and our um, uh, mites and everything like that. So it's a pretty bold statement, but it's probably true. They all come in with internal and external parasites. Um, they also state that a shelter should be familiar with the common parasites in their geographical area. Um, everything changes depending on where you are. Certain species may be more prevalent depending on the location of the shelter. Um, so a great place for you to go check out is the Companion Animal Parasite Council. It is a website. Um, you can use the link, link there. You might have to copy it into your um, web browser, but they have maps on there. Their most recent data, I think, is from 2016, but they might be working on something more recent. Um, they'll tell you where, you ha where, where certain parasites are and how prevalent it is, and it's pretty cool maps to just go play around with. All right, so we're going to do a little bit of a game so you guys can think or write these down if you have a scrap piece of paper or something and see how you do. So do you know the common intestinal parasites? And we're going to be looking at a bunch of fecal samples. So this is an egg from one of our intestinal worms. And I apologize for not having the um, size of whatever, like 40x or so that you're looking at. So anyway, that was a hookworm. Hopefully you got it right. They are very tiny, about 12 to 15 millimeters long. Um, you can see next to the ruler there, the Fisher Scientific Ruler, that those are the tiny, tiny worms. Uh, you don't often see them in the stool sample because they're so small, but you, you can. I've seen a couple of them. Um, and the scientific name for the dog hookworm is Ankylostoma caninum, and the cat hookworm is Ankylostoma tubiforme. Those are just some trivia questions. It's not really that important, but um, good thing for you to know. And both of these hookworms hook onto the mucosa of their associated species in their GI system, and they suck blood. So that we can see some clinical signs with those. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, hookworm, it's good to know all of these life cycles. So this is a pretty intense life cycle, but it's really pretty. They um, develop in the intestines of the dog or cat. So that's where the adults grow. And then the eggs are passed in the feces. So if, um, and then once they're on the ground, if the temperature and humidity are right in the environment, the eggs hatch and develop into an, the infective larval stage. So they do go through some development stages in the environment. Um, that stage takes, that change takes about two to nine days. And then that infective larval will go to, um, can, can pass to the dog a couple different ways. So if you have um, a wound on the, on the paw or so, they can actually puncture through, even not wounds, they, wounds, they can puncture through regular skin too. Um, and then they can travel to the lungs. And then to the muscle, they lay dormant in the muscle for a little bit, and then um, that, if it is a, a female dog, that worm can be passed through the milk onto their um, offspring. Uh, and then they also can go through and go climb up the, the grass and the soil, and then they can pass through the fecal oral route too. So um, that's often how they get it, but it also can pass through the mother's milk too. Um, a fun thing to note is that hookworms can also be found in rodent and cockroach tissue. So um, the dog and cat can ingest the immature worms through eating rodents and cockroaches. So pretty gross. South Carolina, we have these palmetto bugs, so we have to worry about it here. Um, and the good thing to know is that the dog hookworm can be passed through the milk to the puppies. So even if you keep the puppies inside, away from the environment, they can get it from their mother's milk. 
All right. And um, once the larva or immature immature worms reach the intestines, they attach to the mucosa and then they um, suck the blood of the animal. And then the adult worms can live in the intestines for about four to 24 months, so up to two years in the small intestines. And throughout that time, they can shed the eggs intermittently. So one day you might see the hookworm eggs on the fecal and one day you may not. Um, so they can survive in the environment for a long time. The environment has to be great and the humidity and the temperature has to be good for them to go into their infective stage. So a um, couple husbandry things we'll talk about later and how to control the hookworms. So the life cycles are very, very important. And there's a pretty cool um, life cycle video from the Trifexis website, not to advertise for them, but it was pretty cool that I wasn't able to show, but you can go look at that if you want. Um, a couple other things to mention about hookworms. There are two other um, genus and species that we do have to worry about. Um, they can, these ones can penetrate the skin as well of people and animals. Um, sometimes you'll see interdigital lesions, lesions in dogs and cats, like the picture on the top right of that dog, that white dog, um, causes sores between the toes because that is where the worms, the little immature worms, have crawled through and are going to set up shop in the muscle and then head to the intestines. So it's pretty gross. Um, in people, they can also do the same thing. So they can crawl through your toes. If you're on a beach in the Caribbean or so, they can crawl through your toes and also um, cause lesions on your body. So those are called cutaneous larval migraines, if you've ever heard that word before. Another trivia question, um, if you get that right. And so those are the two hookworms that can infect both dogs and cats. They can infect either one of them. Um, they don't cause as much blood loss if they're in dogs and cats, but they can be zoonotic, so you do have to worry about them. Um, Anclostoma brasiliense is the most zoonotic and also is seen in the warmer, warmer coastal areas in um, so Central South, South America and the Caribbean. So um, maybe you're practicing there, maybe you have a shelter there, maybe you transport in animals from there. So these are things you need to worry about and to alert your staff and um, adopters about. All right, so let's move on to, um, again, the Companion Animal Parasite Council. It has these really cool maps. <clears throat> and I included um, the ones for the common ones that we're going to talk about. So hookworm shows one out of 37 dogs are test positive for canine hookworms. And this was in 2016, I believe. And you can see the darker orange um, states are where they're most prevalent. And then I don't know why California doesn't have too many of them, but um, they're doing well out there. And then for the cat <coughs> hookworm, it's not too prevalent. So um, just in the southern southern states, um, we'll have to worry about them. I'm sure it could be a little bit different now as things move around. Um, all right, on to another intestinal parasite. So think about this one. Does anyone know what this one is? Think about it. Write it down. So that was a roundworm egg. They are a little bit larger, well, <laughs> really a lot larger. Um, they can, they're large white worms that we often associate with spaghetti, which is kind of gross. So you can see these in the stool samples. There's a picture on the top right of a roundworm in a puppy's stool. Um, we have to worry about them because they are all zoonotic. Um, Toxocara canis is the one that infects dogs, and Toxocara cati is the one that infects cats. Toxocara leonini can also infect both dogs and cats. Um, and they can all cause visceral and ocular larva migraines in people, so they can travel through your body into certain areas and cause damage. So we worry about them. Life cycle, again, is very, very important. Um, the adult roundworms lay non embryated eggs in their feces, and these eggs develop into the infective stage in about two weeks. So they also have to go through some changes after they are defecated um, to become infective. So that takes about two weeks. Once infected, the eggs can pass to the dog and the cat in many ways. Again, they can go through um, contaminated soil, so fecal oral route. Once they're ingested, the larvae go to the liver and the lungs, are coughed up, and swallowed into the GI tract. So another reason you might see a coughing puppy is um, because these intestinal parasites, the roundworms, are traveling through their system and getting coughed into their GI system. It's pretty gross. <clears throat> uh, pregnant dogs can pass the larval worms into the puppies through birth. So um, they can pass through in utero. Um, 
and they can also be transmitted through mother's milk. So hookworms only through the milk, and roundworms can be passed through in utero and through the milk. So you do have to worry about that. There's a couple other more ways that you can get roundworms, or the puppies can get roundworms. Um, rodents, birds, and earthworms can have the infective stage in their tissue and can be eaten by the dog and cat. So again, worry about your little things running around your shelter. Um, once ingested, the larvae develop into adults in two to eight weeks, depending on the mode of transmission. So it might take a little bit longer or shorter, depending on um, which way the infective stage gets into their system. <clears throat> um, humans can accidentally eat lar larvated eggs. So you see that little kid in the sandbox, it's pretty gross. Um, they can get it through the fecal oral route. Um, and then once ingested, the larvae doesn't really like to set up shop in our intestines. It'll move through our systems into our eye, our brain, and some of our other organs, causing these visceral larval migraines. So pretty gross. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the ways to prevent that. Um, again, with the Companion Animal Council, um, one in 53 dogs will test positive for roundworms. And then, I don't know, but West Virginia has the most, most common cases. And um, <clears throat> roundworms in cats, one in 27 will test positive. So you'll see it. I don't know why you see it mostly in, in cats. And then in the north, in cats. <clears throat> Um, I need to mention Bela Asteris pyocyanosis, which is a raccoon roundworm. Um, it is found in North America and Europe. The eggs can be ingested from raccoon or dog feces or from within rodents, and rabbits, and birds. So the parasite causes, can cause the visceral and larval migraines um, in people. So we have to worry about that because it, be, it can go through, through the dog and be infected, be zoonotic to people. Um, the companion animal, Parasite Council states that two dozen cases are conf of confirmed canine infection with adult raccoon Ascaris, which is this roundworm, have been reported from the Midwestern U.S., and the parasite is now found in Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina. So um, it is prevalent, and it's, and it's going all over. So keep an eye out for it. Um, again, keep your kids out of sandboxes, because they can get infected as well with raccoon feces. Pretty gross. All right, think about this one. Ovoid shape with two bipolar plugs. A little bit smaller. Here it is among the hookworms that we've already identified. I guess it's about the same size as the hookworms. Different shape as a roundworm. That was a whipworm. So they're a little easier to understand because they don't have very many pathways of infection. Um, they only infect dogs for now in the United States. Feline hookworms can occur in the tropical areas, and they're rare in North America. Um, more common to see them in dogs that are greater than six months of age, and they're only transmitted through contaminated soil. So lucky for us, they are not zoonotic, but they're highly resistant in, in the environment, so we do have to worry about them. So whipworm, the scientific name is Trichurus vulpis. The adults are 45 to 75 millimeters long. Um, their eggs are ovoid. They have a thick shell, and they have those bipolar plucks. So those are some of the identifying factors, um, characteristics of them when you look under a microscope. Again, with the life cycle, it's pretty easy. Um, the adult worms are found in the cecum and colum, where they lay unembraided eggs in the feces. Like hookworms, if the environmental temperature is great and the moisture is just right, they will develop into the embryated stage and be the infective stage. Um, so eggs can remain viable for five years in the ground if, it's, if the moisture is right, but then um, if they are in a dry area, then they can desiccate. So they, be, they lose water and they dry out. Um, dogs, foxes, or coyotes could eat these embraided eggs, and the larvae hatch in their small intestine, penetrate and move down the GI tract, developing into adults. So they live in the cecum and the colon. Um, can take about 11 months for this to happen, and then the adults can hang out for 16 months. And as they're hanging out, they can produce up to 2,000 eggs a day. So pretty gross. Again, um, as they're living in the intestines, they can pass the feces or not pass the feces pass the eggs or not pass the eggs in the feces, so we may or may not see them on a fecal. Um, all right. Um, 
with the uh, charts for them. One in 141 dogs will be infected with whipworms. This is again in in 2016. So hopefully the hopefully they'll do some more statistics. Um, and I encourage you, if anyone ever asks you, asks you for this information, please give it. So it's great to know all the information that we possibly can to learn more about these diseases and these uh, parasites. All right, another intestinal parasite. <coughs> this one's sometimes hard to see, and we don't often see it on the um, microscope, but that was a tapeworm. So that is a double-pored dog tapeworm which is Dipyletium caninum. Um, there are a bunch of different tapeworms, but the one we most commonly see is a common tapeworm, which is this um, Dipyletium caninum. It's transmitted through the ingestion of a flea. And then, um, so it's, it's not fecal oral. It's only ingestion of a, of a flea. You cannot get it by eating contaminated feces. Um, and they can, dogs, dogs and cats can shed these little proglottids, which is the little rice looking things, um, as soon as two to three weeks after infection. So if they get the flea, two to three weeks later, you'll see these tapeworms. So oftentimes, if you have a low length of stay, you'll see an animal with fleas that come in, you won't see any tapeworms for a while, and then the, the owners, the new owners, the adoption, um, the doctors will come back and say, oh my god, there's gross things in, in this dog's, dog and cat's stool. It is most likely going to be these rice little things, and it's going to be the and, um, tapeworms. So it's probably when they came in, they ingested a flea, and then now they're shedding it. Gross. So life cycle of a um, tapeworm is that they can, they're infected with the, um, with the flea. So let's, let's back up. So they, um, we started everything with they shed it. So they shed it in the feces. They shed the egg the proglottids, which are those little rice-looking things, and those contain a bunch of egg packets. So those are shed in the feces, and then they can, um, so those will, sh will shed two to three weeks after inge in ingestion of the flea. And then the eggs have to go, so those egg packets have to go through an intermediate host, which is the larval flea, and then they develop in the larval flea into the adult flea, and then are the infective stage. So they do have to go through some some changes out in the environment, and those changes happen in something else. So in this particular tapeworm's case, it is the flea. Um, so that is important to know. They cannot get it from ingesting just the proglottid. It has to go through the flea, or <clears throat> some of the other tapeworms have to go through something else. So I talked about some of the other tapeworms. So there is a cat tapeworm that has to go through a rodent to get become infected. So of course, if you have an outdoor cat that's eating rodents, then um, that is how they're going to get this tapeworm. There are some other tapeworms that dogs can get um, if they are the ones that are going to eat the squirrels and the rodents and the cute little bunnies out, out in the wild. Um, they, can, they can have these other tapeworms. Um, so just to note some of those. Um, Spirometra is sometimes common in, in certain places. It's the, the egg is up on the top right. Uh, that will confuse your staff because they're like, well, it has one bipolar plug, might be whipworms, it kind of looks like hookworms, but um, make sure you identify Spirometra um, from the other ones because the, the treatment is different. So um, this particular one you would see in dogs and cats, it goes, has to go through a copepod, which is that um, little crustacean looking thing at the bottom, and then it's also ingested by a snake or a frog or you know things like that that'll that'll in ingest the shellfish type um, sea animal and then um, that will be infected to the dog. So it has to go through a couple stages to become infected. And then you also have Diplobothrium, which is um, I think more common in the northwest. Um, people can also get this, but again it has to go from the feces to through a copepod through a fish. So there's a couple different stages it has to get through before it can be infected to you or a cat or a dog. All right, so here's another parasite. Um, does anyone know what this is? This is really, really high magnification at, at 40x. Anybody thinking about it to get to my notes? So sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't. You can confuse it with other things. Um, it's seen in cats. Um, this is 
the cat tapeworm. So you can see the gross. This, you can also see them in the feces. So someone brought this to me the other day, and I was disgusted. Um, <laughs> of course, we don't like them people running um, running feces around the shelter. But um, if you if you see that in there, it could be the cat tapeworm. And then, of course, you have some other tapeworms that go through larger animals, so some of your food animals. Um, and then all of the cestodes, which is tapeworm, um, are explained in the Merck Veterinary Manual. Uh, you can go to this website, or you can just Google Merck Veterinary Manual cestode chart, and that'll have um, everything you need to know about all of those tapeworms that we talked about. All right, another parasite. This one's smaller. I was getting those two confused. Think about it. Write it down. They're very, very tiny. So you can see that's a roundworm egg. I think there's a hookworm egg at the bottom right. The roundworm's the dark one in the middle. Um, this particular egg we're talking about are these tiny, tiny circular eggs that you can see. Um, and there you go. This is it explained with everything else. So Ascaris is a is a roundworm. Tricurus we talked about is the whipworm, um, and then hookworm is on the bottom left. And the egg that we were just looking at is an oocyst of Coccidia species. So this is Isospora in this particular case. Um, there's a YouTube video you can watch. So there's a diff bunch of different enteric protozoans is what we call them. Sometimes you'll hear them called coccidia. Um, it's not one particular parasite. It's, it's like a clump of all these other parasites. So they are, um, they, they're also in the intestinal tract of dogs and cats. Cats have species of Isospora, Besononida, Toxoplasma, Hemonida, and, and Sarcocystis. Those are and, and cryptosporidium can be infected of dogs and cats too. So, um, and and then um, it's difficult to differentiate between each of these on the fecal sample. So, um, additional tests might might be required, or um, oftentimes we just treat for either, any one of these. Um, most common one you'll see is Isospora, um, but you, you can see the other ones. You can see Toxoplasma, as, as, you, as you know. Um, sarcocystic cryptosporidium is very, very zoonotic, so we, we do have to worry about these as well. So transmission, the life cycle of these, um, you will have transmission via in, ingestion of infected stool on anything. So the stool can be everywhere, so make sure your cleaning protocols are great. The eggs stick to everything. They can stick to scratching, scratching posts, carpets. Um, the stool must have a sporulated egg. And then they need the right temperature again, um, and the conditions, and the amount of time. So it can take 16 hours for this to happen. So if you have feces that are sitting around for more than 16 hours, the um, isospora or the coccidia can be infected. So the, long, the, the sooner you pick up the feces of the dog and cat, the, the easier it is to prevent this. Um, so, and then another note is toxoplasma can be infected by eating in, infected meat. Um, and then the incubation period is, is about two weeks. Um, so you can, um, there's a small window when the animal is shedding the, the oocyst in its, in its stool, so you might often not see them in the fecal. Um, so diarrhea may, be, may come before you see the oocyst. So you'll see the diarrhea, you'll check it and be like, oh, I can't see anything, I don't know what's wrong. And then you'll see them like two to three days later. So um, you can keep checking fecals or you can prophylactically treat for coccidia um, depending on what your protocol state. So the thing about this is eggs are resistant to disinfectants and cleaning and can't survive for more than one year in the environment. So um, best things to do are pressure washing, I guess, can sometimes loosen the eggs, but you have to worry about spreading them all over the place. Um, make sure that the surfaces are dry before you put the animal back, because if the, if the surface is dry, then most of these intestinal parasites won't be able to turn into their infective stage and then um, consequently harm the animal. So um, I also read somewhere that painted walls can help prevent coccidia from sticking. So I guess if you use a certain type of paint, the coccidia won't stick to the wall. Um, Spot cleaning, um, 
can work, but it, you have to make sure that you remove all the fecal material. Um, and then somebody said that boiling water is the only thing that will kill the oocytes. So um, obviously that's not a good idea to do. But as long as you remove the fecal material as quickly as you can, clean, use proper cleaning protocols, and dry out the cage, um, you're, you're pretty good with, pre with preventing the spread of coccidia. Um, it's very host specific, so you don't have to worry about the cat giving it to a dog or a dog giving it to a cat or a cat giving it to a human um, other than toxoplasma. So that is the one you have to worry about if you have a, a pregnancy in your family or the new adopters. Um, make sure they're not the ones cleaning out the litter box or uh, make sure that they're getting this stool within 16 hours of defecation, which is always not, not feasible. Um, there's certain things to discuss with your new adopters that they need to go discuss with their veterinarian so that everybody's on the same page. Okay, treatment is a good thing to talk about. Um, often supportive care and watch for dehydration. Um, make sure you wash the animals so get all the fe fecal material off of them because they can reinfect themselves. Um, and we do have to talk about a coccidiostat versus a coccidiocidal. So coccidiostats just stop the reproduction. They don't necessarily kill the parasite that's already there. So the um, toxidia can still live, it just won't produce any eggs. You won't see it in the feces, but the, the parasite will still be there causing damage. Um, so those, that often happens when you just treat with Albon or, Albon or TMS. So the new, new thought is to use a coccidiocidal, which will also stop the reproduction and then kill the parasite. So this is panazaril is the, the medication or marquee is a generic word. It's used for horses, and it's also a lot off-label treatment. So this is not something that you guys need to do on your own. You need to have a protocol written by your veterinarian just so that everybody's on the same page and you don't get in trouble for, for providing veterinary services. Um, it'll give you a faster response. Of course, it's a lot of money, but, um, but you can buy like the horse vials, and you can use it for the, for the smaller animals, and, and it goes pretty far pretty far away, so um, hopefully you guys have that ability to use panazaril. We will deworm our cats and puppies and dogs with panazaril on intake. It's not always feasible for everybody, but it's something we'll do here. All right, we have to talk about um, some of the flagellated parasites. So we have Giardia and Trichomonas foetus, and um, these are also fecal oral route. They're really hard to see on the fecals. You need um, special media to test the feces. Some people can see Giardia. I don't think I've ever found Giardia, but I'm also not looking for it too much. Um, it can cause intermittent shedding. So again, if you see one fecal, do one fecal today, you might not see it, but then tomorrow you might see it. So um, that's why we don't always look for it. Um, they are found in two different parts of the intestine. So Giardia is in the small intestines, and Trichomonas is in the larger intestines and the cecum. Um, some other things is, is high humidity will help Giardia. So Giardia is the one that you, you see in the mountains where people are drinking contaminated water, and then they're going to get the diarrhea from that. So you'll have um, kind of a pale, malodorous, um, mucus, mucousy and fatty stool, uh, usually diarrhea. You'll see it in people and along with animals, or you might not see anything. It might just be a coincidental finding that you have Giardia. Um, and then same with Trichomonas, it might, you might not see anything, or you can have chronic diarrhea and fecal incontinence. So some of these cases that you're not, you're not getting control of, you can talk to your staff to see if you can send off or talk to your management to see if you can send off a fecal sample for these special tests to see if you have any of these other things that are going on um, that you might not be aware of or be able to test for um, in your shelter. So clinical signs, um, some of these parasites don't cause clinical signs like we just talked about, but in our shelter situations we see high worm burdens um, since many of us, many of the animals come to us not from the cleanliest situations or being taken care of. So they might have a high worm bur burden, um, and then those will co consequently cause signs. So you can see in the bottom that that, that roundworm, um, roundworms are full in the intestine, so that can cause a blockage, that can cause severe diarrhea, it can cause dehydration. So we do, we do worry about it a lot. Um, so hookworms, you'll see the anemia. Um, 
especially if you have infected puppies, they're not able to control it very well, and you'll see the pale mucous membrane, so that's something you can look for. You can also get a stool sample and find them in the fecal. Uh, roundworms, you might see this pot-bellied appearance. You might see just weakness, diarrhea, dull coat. Um, roundworms are the ones that will trans transport from the um, from anywhere and then travel along your trachea and then get coughed up and then go into the intestine. So you'll see coughing. Um, you can see them in the stool and the vomit. Again, these are just some pictures. These guys look pretty pink on my picture here, but that's just one way that you can check for um, pale mucous membranes to determine if the dog's anemic, dog or cat's anemic. Of course, I would encourage you to wear gloves, which nobody's wearing in these pictures. Um, whipworms. Uh, might not see anything at all. You might just see kind of abdominal pain. This boxer is in an acute abdomen stance, so it's it's painful. It's trying to relieve the pressure on its abdomen, so it's kind of bowing down like a play stance, but it's really not. It's on the, it's on the exam table. It's not feeling well. You might see unexplained weight loss, diarrhea, um, and whipworms can cause intussusceptions, which is where the intestines kind of fall into each other, kind of like a um, Chinese finger trap kind of example. It's easier to show you, but um, and that can cause a blockage in the intestine. So you, they might present as a possible foreign body. So we worry about that with whipworms. Um, tapeworms don't often see any signs. You might see the dogs scooting or itching their butt. Um, the only thing that we often see is the owners come back and say that they see these gross little white um, tapeworm looking things. Uh, the top right picture is of a tapeworm, but I also wanted to show you that the, the rectum of this kitty is, is almost being prolapsed. So whipworms especially will cause you to strain to defecate because of the diarrhea. Uh, when with that straining, if they strain so much, their rectum will fold out of, your, of the body um, and cause a rectal prolapse. Um, that is an emergency procedure where you have to obviously treat the intestinal parasites, but uh, have to push that tissue back in because it's not used to being out in the environment and can cause dry, become, become dry and um, damage. So you have to, it's a kind of an emergency situation to get that taken care of. Okay, coccidia is brought on by stress. So lots of times all of the animals that come in will have it, but they don't cause the signs until they're, um, they're stressed. So in severe cases, you can cause diarrhea, um, weight loss and dehydration, or they might not even show any signs at all. So how do we recognize when an animal has intestinal parasites? Um, again, we would do walkthroughs every day to so make sure there's a medical staff or any kind of staff walking through, making sure everybody has normal stool, that they're eating, they don't have any respiratory signs, they're not vomiting, um, things like that. And then as soon as you notice diarrhea or you see these intestinal parasites, you start treatment. Um, if you see diarrhea, start doing the test. So any trained individual can detect this. Um, you can see them on the microscope. So you can perform a fecal flotation test. You have all these supplies in your hospital um, or your clinic or your shelter. So you have to have a microscope. You have to have a cover slip, which is the thing on the bottom. You have to have a microscope slide. Um, you do have to have fecosol or a sodium nitrate solution um, or a fecalizer is what uh, and then you also have a fecalizer, which is a fancy little tube, that green tube, um, that helps you break down the feces and, and extrapolate the eggs from there. So you guys probably all know this, but just to go over this quickly, the little green thing in the fecalizer, you take some of the poop, hopefully you wear gloves too, um, and scoop up the poop and then put it in the white plastic container. Um, you can kind of roll it around, rub it around, kind of mix it up with that too. Then you put the fecosol on top of the green, like in the green little tube. You form a meniscus, which is when there's a bubble of liquid at the top of a container. So that green area will have a little bit of a bubble of fluid on top. Uh, and then you put the cover slip on top of that bubble. So that um, will hopefully, once all the eggs start coming up from the bottom in about 10 minutes will be stuck to the cover slip and then you'll take that cover slip off, put it on a microscope slide, look under the microscope and you'll see some of the intestinal parasites, the eggs that we have talked about. See, these are some of the images that we've already talked about. 
Um, it's ideal to have all of these charts. You don't have to have all of them. You can have one or two of them. Um, they'll show you the different sizes that you're looking for. So some of them you can see, like the coccidia, you can see on the higher power versus the hookworms and the roundworms you'll see on the lower power. You'll see them more quickly. Um, so this is a good way to um, distinguish which, which sizes that you're going to be looking for. You can also send out um, ELISA tests on them. They're like these plate assay tests. Uh, we don't use them here. We're, we're pretty good with our trained staff to um, look at fecals and to see certain things. If they have a question, they can come to somebody else with more experience. So one or two staff members that are great at looking at fecals is, is ideal because um, these can be pretty pricey. So ideally, you would have a written protocol by your veterinarian just so everybody's on the same page like we've talked about. Um, uh, we, the ASV recommends deworming at intake, at least with pyrantal, so at least to treat the, the roundworms and the hookworms, uh, because those are the most zoonotic. So at least deworm them before they leave the shelter. Ideally, you do it at intake. We'll do it here on intake. Um, the CDC will recommend prophylactic treatment of dogs and cats at two weeks of age, and then um, treatment with pyrantal every two weeks until the puppy's about 12 weeks old and then monthly until six months. So if you think about the life cycles we've talked about, um, some of these intestinal parasites can stay around in your GI system and then pass in your feces. So you have to um, make sure you get, get each little stage and get them while they're um, changing in the animal's body too. So you need to you treat them often. So whipworms especially, you treat them, and then you treat them again in three weeks because they can be dormant for a while and not be susceptible to the treatment until a little bit later. All right. Um, you don't have to isolate any of these animals. Dogs who are being treated for intestinal parasites can be housed in general population. Um, unless there's commingling and not proper cleaning, uh, make sure that they're on non-porous surface that can be easily disinfected. Um, how to clean these areas, so follow the ASV guidelines. Dr. Bryce will talk about it. Best to remove feces as soon as possible. If you remember with coccidia, those oocysts will form into the infective stage in 16 hours, so quick removal of the feces is the best idea. Um, keep kennels dry. Some of, some of the ones we talked about, um, whipworms and hookworms, will, will proliferate and go into their infective stage if the moisture is right and the environment is right. So remember the life cycles. Whipworms are the most resistant, um, and they're all impossible to remove from the soil. So uh, make sure you're following the proper cleaning protocol and keeping things dry. This is just a quick little chart that you guys can come back to, hopefully, um, about some of the common treatments that you can use for these intestinal parasites. Again, all of these might not be feasible for you, so discuss with your veterinarian influence to see which ones are best for you and the shelter. So I don't have too much longer, but um, can't talk about diarrhea without talking about canine parvovirus and feline panleukopenia because some of us will see these in our shelter, um, even if we don't want it to happen in our shelter. So um, let me get to my notes about both of these because there's a lot to talk about. Um, so canine parvovirus is most commonly, one of the most commonly seen diseases in the shelter setting. It's a non-enveloped virus, um, which leads to it being extremely hardy in the environment. If surfaces are not cleaned properly, the virus can survive for up to several months, um, depending on the substrate it's on. The persistence of the virus in the environment, coupled with its highly contagious, contributes to the spread of the disease. So we don't take our puppies outside just in case they have parvo. Um, we, we let them defecate in, in their cages and clean them up as, pos as quickly as possible. Um, uh, much like canine distemper virus, canine parvovirus is um, not commonly seen when vaccination is common. So as long as we're vaccinating, we keep vaccinating for these diseases, we won't see it as often. Um, the virus is shed in the feces. It's um, after making contact with the feces, the most common one of the most common mode of transmission is just making contact with the feces. So you see this little Weimaraner um, can get it just by sniffing and smelling and getting it on their fur. Um, it's pretty easy, easy to get. It's highly contagious. Um, incubation period is anywhere from 4 to 14 days. So this Weimaraner might show signs in 4 days or might show signs in 14 days. Um, shedding usually begins 3 days after exposure and can continue for 7 to 12 days. So they might be shedding it before they show signs, which is the scary part. 
Um, oftentimes, if you have a confirmed case of parvovirus, you quarantine that animal for at least 14 days because that's their shedding period and you don't want to contaminate anybody else. Ideally, you'd get them out of the shelter so they're not even posing a risk to be contaminated, contaminating anything. Um, but, so, but oftentimes, we, we're, it's not a feasible thing. So foster care, having adopters that were OK with adopting them, um, all, all things you need to consider. So vomiting and diarrhea can be seen um, caused, caused by the gastroenteritis. The parvovirus is damaging the uh, muco mucus cells of the intestines. Um, they can cause immunosuppression and destruction of those cells, and they can have risk for secondary infections, too. So treatment um, is similar to other viral pathogens. Unfortunately, we don't have like a let's kill the virus treatment. We, have, we just have to support them. So we do supportive care, which is making sure they eat. So that's a new thing. The quicker the animal eats with parvovirus and panleukopenia, um, the, the higher prognosis, the greater prognosis for them. So early recognition and aggressive treatment is very important. Um, antimicrobials may be given, so antibiotics may be given to reduce the risk of secondary infections. Um, so there, there are ways to do outpatient protocols. So if the animal doesn't look that, that ill and it just came up positive with parvovirus, might have a little diarrhea, might have some vomiting, um, and it doesn't look that ill, there are outpatient protocols that you can follow. Um, your veterinarians can follow and, and get these animals out of the shelter into maybe the finder brought them in and they, they do want to treat and they're okay with treating at home. Um, there are ways that you can, you can treat parvovirus. Of course, it's, it's going to be costly, so these are things you need to discuss with everybody. Um, but getting them out of the shelter is the best idea and um, supporting them with fluid therapy and getting them to eat. So feline panleukopenia, I don't know if I have a specific chart just for... Oh, here's my chart on all of the, on the parvo. So, um, so this is talking about feline panleukopenia. So it's the most common cause of sudden death in kittens and shelters, kittens and cats in shelters. Um, it's a type of parvovirus. It's also contaminated or also um, transmitted through direct contact or fecal contamination. Um, the fomites, which are any kind of thing that's going to transport the fecal material to the kitten or cat can be infective, um, can, can be infective immediately, uh, and you can still spread the disease. It can stay on, stay on your system for a long time. Um, it can stay in the environment for up to one year, and um, if you, if we, we are vaccinating for it, so it's, it's not commonly seen in areas that are using this vaccine. Um, but you can also see it in unvaccinated animals, like we see all the time, and very young animals. Um, it can be fatal. It's highly contagious. Um, it's imperative that the shelter staff uses proper protected equipment so they're not spreading this um, very easily on their clothes, on their hands, make sure they're washing their hands. Um, it causes, it's called panleukopenia because it causes a reduction in the white blood cells. Same with parvovirus. Um, and then the white blood cells are the cells that are used for your immune system to, um, to prevent you from having uh, infections with other things or secondary infections. So if you don't have a lot of white blood cells, you can get sec secondary infections, and then you can go downhill quickly. So again, with um, both of these parvovirus viruses, you can, they can shed them for several weeks. Um, Incubation period can be two to ten days, so they can be shedding before they even show signs. Um, and treatment is supportive care. Um, and you can do outpatient protocols again for panleukopenia, but to me, I think it's a little bit more dire because these kittens are often seen tiny and they deteriorate pretty quickly, and they don't come to us when they're um, early in the disease. So um, you can use the canine parvo snap test. You can use that also with feline stool, um, feces, you can, they'll test for the same thing and you can, you can test for parvovirus. The test is made up to do both of them. Um, so I had a video, but do you know what does feline parvovirus or panleukopenia virus do to a mother's kittens if she is infected in utero? Really cool video of this disease. Um, cerebellar hypoplasia or ataxia is what we see, so it'll damage the cerebellum of the fetuses. 
and the baby or the excuse me the kitten will come out and and be a little bit wobbly. They'll have a tremoring in their head. Um, they might not be able to walk very well, but if, if you have the adopters for them, they do fairly well in a home. They just have to learn to recuperate and to um, manage themselves around the house. So it's, it's, it's an adoptable disease. Um, all right, so which disinfectants kill parvovirus? Think about that. So um, the Rocal or Parvosol does not kill parvovirus. Um, I don't know why they, they branded it that way, but um, only the bottom four, um, of course, bleach with the 1 to 32 concentration, the wishy wash, the dry, trifectin, and the XL. So we use trifectin or XL here because, again, those get the respiratory diseases too, and you don't have to wipe away the organic material. All right, feline infectious peritonitis, I believe, is one of the last things we're going to talk about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we don't really know much about it. It is um, caused by feline coronavirus, which feline coronavirus is a highly contagious virus. Um, they say that FIP is not contagious, um, but there's, I think there's some differing opinions, and as we learn more about the disease, um, things might change. So uh, coronavirus is shed through the feces, um, and they... I don't think that's supposed to be 105%. I think that's 10%. We'll have to fix that later. Um, not very many cats that have feline coronavirus will develop FIP. So um, it's not that prevalent, but it can happen. So the virus, coronavirus, will mutate in the host, within the host. There's specific host factors that cause this to happen. Um, we don't know 100% what they are, but the coronavirus will change into a different form and cause feline infectious peritonitis. Um, signs are nonspecific. You'll have lethargy, fever, weight loss, failure to thrive, which is kind of what anything can cause. Um, the dry form can happen later on in life where you'll see mass-like lesions. Um, and then the wet form is caused by, um, again, the edema and the vasculitis that we see with Khaleesi virus sometimes. Um, we'll see uh, a distended abdomen. Um, and there is no treatment, of course, um, and then it's also considered fatal. Uh, there's really nothing we can do about it. We can, we can prevent it with proper cleaning, uh, make sure removing feces, and um, there's no great test for it. You can test the fluid in the abdomen. Um, there's a specific look to it. You can send it out to the lab, and they can t test for the virus in the, in the abdominal fluid. Um, you can try supportive therapy, but it's not often helpful. Um, Let's see what else I needed to say. I think we have some pictures. Um, oh, there's an animation in there. So the Coret Shelter Medicine Program, which is out in Florida, says ultimately the best defense against FIP are practices that involve good sanitation and biosecurity, humane housing. Um, so do the compartmentalized housing, so keep the litter box separate from the food and the water and the resting place. And then decrease stress, which we talked about, and the decreased length of stay. So the shorter the stay, the less stress they have, and the more room they have, so they're not interacting with their fecal material too often, um, is the best way to prevent this from happening. So the picture on the left is a fluid-filled abdomen of a kitten. So we will see fluid distension. Of course, this can mean other things, but if your veterinarian thinks that there's a bunch of fluid in there, um, they can take a sample of it, look at it, and send it into the lab. Um, and you can, you can tell if the cat or kitten has FIP. Um, later on in life, they might develop this like, serous material in their, in their body, um, causing mass-like lesions on their organs. I don't see any specific things to show you here, but I think it's just showing you that yellow material that's in the abdomen of that cat. So kind of, kind of gross. Sorry to end with, with that um, gross picture. So, and we are finished. So these are just some cute little poems to end the diarrhea lecture. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thanks.